Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Advancing Our Understanding of Chronic Pain, Diagnosing and Treating Chronic Pain. My name is Allegra Jaffe and I am a social service specialist with the Caregiver and Supportive Service Unit with the Fairfax Area Agency on Aging. Before I introduce today's speaker, I will go over a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded and the link for the recording will be sent to all the registrants within a week from today. We have enabled closed captioning in case you need it. Also, there is a Q&A button uh, where you can submit your questions. We are going to allocate a few minutes at the end of the presentation so we can address any questions that you may have. Um, and lastly, there will be a brief survey as you sign out. If you could please take a moment to fill that survey, it will help us create programs that are relevant and important to our caregiving community. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Daniel Claw. Dr. Daniel Claw is a professor of anesthesiology, medicine, uh, rheumatology, and psychiatry at the University of Michigan. He attended undergraduate and medical school at the University of Michigan following which he did an internal medicine residency and rheumatology fellowship at Georgetown University. He stayed at Georgetown as a faculty member from 1990 through 2002, serving as chief of the division of rheumatology and vice chair of medicine. While at Georgetown, he founded the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, and in 2002 was recruited to bring this group to the University of Michigan where the group has become one of the most successful research, uh, pain research groups in the world. He also served as the first PI of the University of Michigan Clinical and Translational Science Award, as well as the first Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Research, and founded the institute that houses the UMCTSA, the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research. He has over 450 peer-reviewed publications, over $100 million in federal funding, and is currently co-PI of four NIH center grants and two R01s studying various aspects of chronic pain. He has also been a very active mentor, serving as the primary mentor for 35 NIH K awardees, nearly all who have gone to obtain R series funding or the equivalent. Dr. Claw, welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, please take it away. You seeing the screen okay? Yes, it looks good. Uh, so first, my disclosure slide, uh, you can see I do uh, do consulting for a number of companies that are trying to develop new non-opioid analgesic drugs. Um, and you see at the bottom um, that I'm not a big fan of using opioids to treat chronic pain. I have testified um, against the opioid manufacturers in several states. Um, so I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about um, uh, fibromyalgia. Um, <clears throat> Our group is arguably one of the leading groups in the world in sort of studying and legitimizing fibromyalgia. And a lot of the early work that our group did was just up the road. I lived in Fairfax County and both in Falls Church and in Great Falls while I was uh, at Georgetown. So, um, but fibromyalgia has come a long way. L literally when I was in training at Georgetown in the late 1980s, the um, current knowledge about fibromyalgia was that um, my mentors at the time gave me an article that was written in the Washingtonian, which most of you who live in Fairfax County would know um, is not at all a scientific journal. It's a um, magazine where they have great reviews of restaurants and things like that, but there was so little known about fibromyalgia at the time um, that all that article really said is that we think fibromyalgia is a real disease, but we really don't know anything about it. Um, but I was fascinated by fibromyalgia, because I didn't think that people were really making this up. A lot of physicians at the time really thought, uh, because especially because most of the people with fibromyalgia originally were women, um, that there was really a 
widespread belief that this pain wasn't real and and people were sort of faking this or somehow making it up. In 1990, there were um, the first criteria to diagnose fibromyalgia, and those really helped the fibromyalgia field and helped um, start it, allowed us to do trials in fibromyalgia and to do mechanistic studies to figure out what really was going wrong in people with fibromyalgia. Um, and, and fibromyalgia has come so far now from 1990 to present um, that the International Group of Pain Researchers a few years ago actually formally voted um, and said that there was a third mechanism of pain that we didn't really know about or understand until the last 10 years or so, and that fibromyalgia uh, uh, was sort of the poster child for this type of pain. In, in this kind of pain, the pain isn't occurring because someone has damage or inflammation in the area or areas of body that they're experiencing pain. This kind of pain that we see in conditions like fibromyalgia, um, it seems to be coming more from the central nervous system in the brain um, rather than it being a problem um, out in the periphery where people are feeling the pain. And we also know that when people have conditions like fibromyalgia and when they have this kind of pain, they don't just have pain, they have sleep problems, fatigue, memory problems, mood problems. Um, and so this um, set of pain syndromes now, unfortunately, the term that's being used is sort of a mouthful. It's called nosoplastic pain. Um, one of the older terms I think is actually a lot more useful to talk to patients about this is called centralized pain or central sensitization, because that term central really means that the pain is coming from the central nervous system rather than from the, the area of the body where the person's experiencing pain. And uh, believe it or not, uh, fibromyalgia has come a long way such that the now we actually understand fairly well what the fundamental problem is um, in individuals with conditions like fibromyalgia, and I'll talk about that. Um, so some of the terms I'm going to talk about today, again, uh, I use the same slides to talk to patients and caregivers as I do to talk to scientists and doctors. So some of the words on the slides um, might be long, busy words, but I learned a long time ago that a lot of chronic pain patients and caregivers are actually quite knowledgeable about pain. So I don't um, turn, I don't talk down um, to that group of people. I just try to use terms that are understandable to the lay public. And so we know that um, the features of this kind of pain, whether you want to call it nosoplastic pain or um, a term that's being used more in Europe is that called primary pain. And what that means is that the pain is the primary problem rather than being secondary to osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or sickle cell disease or some kind of problem that should cause pain. We know that one of the best ways to identify that someone has this kind of pain is the pain is gonna be more widespread. It's gonna involve more regions of the body. Um, individuals with this kind of pain, again, will often have sleep problems, fatigue, memory problems. And in fact, we think that the sleep problems in particular might often be the start of this in individuals. And certainly one of the things we do when we identify that someone has this kind of pain is we immediately really work very hard at trying to get them a good quality sleep, a very deep sleep, because that will actually help improve this kind of pain. Individuals with this kind of pain, um, are not just more sensitive to pain anywhere throughout their body, they're more sensitive to the brightness of lights, the loudness of noises, odors. Um, and so now we know using techniques like brain imaging, functional brain imaging, that brain regions like the insula, again, the, the term isn't important, but the brain regions that are involved in sort of setting the amplifier or the volume control for how sensitive you are to a light, how loud you feel um, a noise is, um, that same brain region sort of tells your brain uh, how pain sensitive you are. And the fundamental problem in these types of conditions is that the brain, people will feel pain in different areas of their body, um, even with just light touch or pressure or things like that, that wouldn't cause pain in someone that doesn't have this kind of problem. Uh, I also am going to talk about um, some of the sleep problems, the mood problems, the catastrophizing that we see in chronic pain patients, and that in many cases we see that people with pain become depressed. People with 
pain um, have these catastrophic thoughts that their pain is terrible and that it's not going to get better, in part because we, um, as healthcare providers, haven't done much to make their pain better, and that's the way they feel, the way they do. Um, but I'll also talk, um, again, about the inner relationship between sleep and pain and a lot of evidence now um, that, of course, if you have pain, that might cause you to sleep poorly, but we also know that poor sleep causes more pain, so it's a vicious cycle. Um, and again, we work really hard at getting people sleeping better. And we're trying to move in a precision medicine direction and start to use more and more therapies um, that we used to be actually fairly dismissive of in Western medicine, certainly when I was trained um, at Georgetown um, 30 or so years ago, things like acupuncture, tai chi, yoga, uh, chiropractic manipulation were not things that I was taught um, were effective for use in chronic pain patients, but we're learning that more and more of these therapies that we used to think of as complementary alternative therapies are the mainstream therapies. They work as well as any drug um, or procedure we can do for this kind of pain, and yet um, that the, they're um, safe and they're uh, very inexpensive in most cases. And then I'll talk a little bit about using websites or apps to treat pain in general. So these are two individuals' knee x-rays. I um, start the main part of my talk usually showing these two knee x-rays. And um, what I was literally trained uh, in the um, late 80s as a rheumatologist that Everyone with the x-ray on the left would have no pain. This is an entirely normal knee x-ray. Um, and that everyone with the x-ray on the right, which has very advanced arthritis here, the person has lost all the cartilage in their knee, that um, I was taught that everyone with this x-ray on the right and no one with the x-ray on the left would have pain. And then in the 1990s, a lot of studies began to show that there's a not a very good relationship at all between what you see on an x-ray and whether someone has pain. People with conditions like fibromyalgia can have an x-ray like the one on the left, have an entirely normal knee x-ray, and their um, knee can still hurt a lot. But what's even more surprising is that 30 or 40% of people in the United States that have a knee x-ray like the one on the right, they have advanced arthritis on their x-ray, but they don't feel any pain whatsoever. And so as we've begun to understand how important the central nervous system and the brain is in pain processing, it doesn't just help us understand why individuals um, can have pain even though they have a normal x-ray like the one on the left. We also now are better understanding why so many individuals um, have something really wrong with their x-ray, but they don't have any pain. And these individuals on the right that have something wrong with their x-ray, but don't really have any pain, um, are less pain sensitive. So if you happen to be more pain sensitive, you can have pain um, even with a normal x-ray. And if you're less pain sensitive, um, even though your x-ray or your MRI looks like you should have pain, you don't have any pain whatsoever. Um, and so this is sort of my 30 year career as we've learned that osteoarthritis isn't our classic peripheral pain syndrome as I was taught in that there is a poor relationship between what we see on an x-ray and whether someone's experiencing pain or not. Psychological factors really don't really explain much of this. And a lot of the treatments that we thought worked really well to treat conditions like osteoarthritis of the knee actually don't work well at all. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these were drugs that again, were just coming out as I was being trained. Now, a lot of these drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen are widely available over the counter um, as drugs like um, uh, Aleve or Nuprin or Advil. Um, these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be really helpful for both acute and chronic pain, but they don't work that well. Only about one out of three people with osteoarthritis of the knee responds really well to these drugs. Drugs like acetaminophen or Tylenol, we used to think they worked better for pain than they do. Um, they work a, a little bit in some people. Um, and opioids, again, don't get me started, um, but opioids should rarely be used to treat chronic pain, really only after individuals have failed to respond to everything else. Um, they don't work very well, um, and there's a lot of dangers associated with opioids. But even joint replacement surgery, we used to think that almost everyone that had something wrong with their joint that got replaced their joint um, with a titanium new joint, that almost everyone would get better, but at least 30% of people that get joint replacement surgery don't get better. And so, so why is this? 
Um, and this is an analogy I started using a long time ago, um, maybe while I was still at Georgetown, but if, if not, not long after that, that the amount of pain that someone experiences is analogous to um, an electric guitar. Um, and you know that there's two ways that you can make an electric guitar louder. You can either strum the strings harder or you can turn up the amplifier. And if I show those two knees that I showed you earlier, um, in order for someone to experience pain, the information from their knee has to go up through the spinal cord and up into the brain to be felt as pain. Um, and different people have different amplifier settings. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to be have a low amplifier setting, um, then you might have this x-ray and not have any pain because even though you have something really wrong with your knee, this amplifier is set really low and this information is not allowed to the, go to the brain to be felt as pain. And in conditions like fibromyalgia, people don't have to have anything wrong with their knee. If your amplifier is set very high, um, you, you know this, if you set an amplifier very high, even if you don't have it tuned to a channel, um, eventually there will just be noise. And that literally is what happens in these chronic pain conditions, these nosoplastic pain conditions like fibromyalgia or headache or irritable bowel, um, that the pain is really come is an amplifier problem rather than a guitar problem. But this is really important. This recognition is really important because um, if we see someone who has knee pain who, and we think that their problem is more of an amplifier problem than a guitar problem, then we wouldn't use surgery or injections because the treatments that work um, out in the guitar um, are only going to work if someone's pain is coming from the guitar. Um, they're, they're, uh, but if the fundamental problem is an amplifier problem, we have to use treatments that turn down the amplifier. And it's another, it's an entirely different set of drugs. And we have to more aggressively use non-drug therapies, get people sleeping better, get them active, get them involved in some of those integrative therapies that I alluded to earlier and that I'll talk more about um, that can be really helpful um, in sort of turning down the amplifier. And so until about five or so years ago, the International Group of Pain Researchers, there were only the two columns on the left, that pain was either nociceptive pain, it was due to inflammation or damage in the area of the body where you're experiencing pain and classic nociceptive pain conditions would be osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disorder, cancer pain, uh, nerve pain. Most people know that you can have nerve pain. You can have um, painful neuropathy from diabetes. You can have carpal tunnel syndrome. You can have sciatica. Um, these are all um, nerve pain or neuropathic pain syndromes. But this third category, it really wasn't until five to 10 years ago that the International Group of Pain Researchers uh, agreed that there was this third mechanism of pain called centralized or nosoplastic pain, where the pain is really coming more so from the central nervous system or a systemic problem. Um, the pain is much more widespread. It's accompanied by these symptoms like fatigue, sleep, memory, and mood problems. Um, and again, these individuals are not just sensitive to pain, they're sensitive to the brightness of lights and noises and odors. But this was a big deal um, because this actually might be the most common underlying cause of pain. And until five or 10 years ago, we really didn't know anything about these pain conditions, or at least they weren't legitimate. Um, now everyone in the pain field not only believes fibromyalgia is real, but it's thought to be, again, the poster child for a third mechanism of pain. And so the older term was central sensitization. This is just an article we wrote a couple of years ago, saying that even if you start with something like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or cancer or sickle cell disease, where there is damage or inflammation in the different areas of the body because of that disease, even some of those individuals develop this other kind of pain, this central sensitization or nosoplastic pain. And when they do, um, even someone with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or sickle cell disease might need to be treated as the, the same way someone with fibromyalgia would need to be treated because the fundamental problem then in that problem is more of an amplifier problem rather than a guitar problem. And so this term nosoplastic pain for better or for worse is a occurring more and more in the literature. And again, I've talked about this over and over again, that it's not just pain, it's fatigue, sleep, memory, and mood problems. Um, and that's what we look for in individuals. We see that over the course of an individual's lifetime, they just haven't just had pain in one area of the body. They've had pain in multiple different areas of the body. Often in these individuals, the pain moves around over the course of their lifetime. Um, and that intermittently over the course of their lifetime, they have a lot of problems with sleep 
and fatigue and memory problems as well. Um, there's another new term that's been identified calling all of these conditions here chronic overlapping pain conditions because many individuals that have one of these conditions actually have many of these conditions that more than half of the people with fibromyalgia will meet criteria for irritable bowel syndrome and more than half of the people with irritable bowel will meet criteria for fibromyalgia and most people with either fibromyalgia or irritable bowel will have tension or migraine headaches and so we know that these conditions occur more commonly in individuals if someone um, has in your family has one of these conditions, it's much more likely you're going to get one of these conditions. And so these are called chronic overlapping pain conditions in that all of these conditions um, are really thought to be the same kind of central sensitization, no soplastic pain. But um, if the pain is in the vaginal region, it will be called vulvodynia. If the pain is in the pelvic region in a woman, it will be called endometriosis. If it's in the back, it'll just be called low back pain. A lot of these Labels are just merely labels that when the pain is in that area of the body, that's the label for the pain, but it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. There's no damage or inflammation in that area of the body causing the pain. And so the new criteria for fibromyalgia um, don't require us counting tender points anymore. We give people this piece, piece of paper. And I'd recommend, um, if you have chronic pain, I'd recommend looking at this and sort of filling it out while I'm talking here. On the left, we ask people to check the different regions of the body where they have pain, and there's 19 different sites on this region, and you score yourself from zero to 19, depending on how many of these regions you have chronic pain in. And then you come over to the right side and you score zero, one, two, or three, depending on whether you have sleep problems, memory problems, fatigue, and then that's scored zero, one, two, or three, depending on whether that's not a problem, slight, moderate, or severe. And then you come down to the bottom, and if you have irritable bowel, i.e. pain or cramps in the abdomen, that gets you one point. Depression gets you one point, and headache gets you one point. So there's 19 um, sites on the body map. You can score as high as 19 if you have pain in every area of your body. There's nine points over here if you have severe uh, sleep, memory, and fatigue problems, and there's three points over here for a score, a total score of 31, and if your score is 13 or higher, you actually meet criteria for fibromyalgia. We don't have to do an exam or anything like that. Now, um, what I'm gonna con try to convince you of is that if your score is six or seven or higher, you have a higher than average volume control setting and you might not quite meet criteria for fibromyalgia, but um, if you take that fibromyalgia measure and you score seven, eight, nine or higher, what that indicates is that it's likely some of your pain is coming more from an amplifier rather than a guitar, and that um, some of the treatments that I'm going to talk about that work a lot better for this kind of pain are maybe things that you or the people you're helping take care of should try. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, this is sort of intuitive, even if without medical training. If someone comes in with knee pain and they have pain in a single spot in their knee, it's likely that that person's pain is coming from an entirely different cause than if I ask them to fill out this body map and they have pain all over like this fibromyalgia patient. But a lot of physicians don't pick up on that. And, if, and a lot of times when a patient goes in, they just are narrowly focused on the area of the body where they have pain. And so they don't tell the doctor about all this other pain. And that does, they don't actually think that the person might have something more so like fibromyalgia rather than osteoarthritis of the knee. And so a lot of people that have conditions like fibromyalgia don't know it because they haven't been diagnosed. They carry labels like low back pain or osteoarthritis or um, different types of pain syndromes. And no one has really picked up on the fact that their pain is more of a guitar problem than an amplifier. I mean, I, I'm sorry, more of an amplifier problem than a guitar problem. And the treatments you're going to need for this kind of pain are really quite different than the treatments like surgery or injections. Um, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that you would use um, if the pain in your knee really is coming from your knee rather than coming from your brain. These are studies that we did. And again, I'm not going to try to go in depth in these studies, but we took people that were either having surgery um, because of osteoarthritis of the knee, they were either having joint replacement surgery, or they were getting a hysterectomy for chronic pelvic pain. And on the day of surgery, um, 
that we asked them to fill out a whole bunch of different um, patient reported outcomes, i.e. Le like self-report forms that they fill out that, that assessed what their anxiety level and depression level and catastrophizing and all these different things. And the only thing really that was unique is that on the day of surgery and all of these studies that we were doing, we also had people fill out the fibromyalgia measure. And what our hypotheses were, that the higher that someone scored on this fibromyalgia measure, the more opioids they would need to treat their acute pain, just the first pain in the first 24 to 40 hours before people got discharged, um, opioids don't work to treat this kind of pain, this fibromyalgia-like pain. And so we hypothesized that the higher that someone's fibromyalgia score on the day of surgery, the less well that opioids would work to treat their pain. But we also hypothesized that surgery wouldn't work as well, that a higher fibromyalgia score, um, if people either got knee or hip replacement surgery for their pain, or they got a hysterectomy uh, for their pain, our hypotheses were that the higher the fibromyalgia score, the uh, less well that would work. And it turned out to be true that what we found first in osteoarthritis was that for each one point increase in that fibromyalgia measure on the day of surgery, people needed a lot more um, narcotics or opioids to control their acute pain. And they were a lot less likely to get better if they had surgery. Um, and it didn't matter if people had fibromyalgia, if they scored 13 or greater, each one point increase in that fibromyalgia score made them less surgery responsive and less opioid responsive. And this is just showing you, <clears throat> there is two different people. Um, on the bottom of this graph is the fibromyalgia score. And on the left side of the graph are the number of the people that had that score. These are two different patients. Um, the red line is 13. So people that on that fibromyalgia measure scored 13 or higher would have been on the right side of that red line. But this is someone that doesn't have fibromyalgia. He has a fibromyalgia score of 11. So you have to have 13 or greater to have fibromyalgia. But he just has a higher degree of fibromyalgia than this person over here. They both get their knee replaced. And look at how different they are. Patient B needs a lot more opioids to control his pain, just his acute pain in the first 24 to 48 hours and patient B um, is much less likely to get improvement if we operate on his knee. And what we did um, subsequently is show the exact same findings in, in women getting a hysterectomy. Each one point increase in the fibromyalgia score made them less opioid responsive and less surgery responsive. Uh, this is again, the hysterectomy studies. And so if we go back to that, um, table that I showed you earlier, now what I'm superimposing is all of these conditions, even if you have the label of osteoarthritis of your knee, you might have osteoarthritis of your knee, but about 30% of people with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or cancer also have this kind of pain over here. So even though the label implies that all of your pain is coming from your knee um, and that drugs like non-steroidals or treatments like injections or surgery are going to work, that a lot of people with osteoarthritis or autoimmune disease or um, chronic pelvic pain, the reason the surgery doesn't work is that um, a lot of people, the pain in their knee or pain in their pelvis isn't coming from their knee or their pelvis is coming from the brain. And if we operate in their knee or their pelvis, pain that is coming from the brain isn't going to get better. And so, um, our group does all sorts of things like functional brain imaging. And these first studies here, the first functional MRI studies um, ever done in the world in people with condition like fibromyalgia were done by our group while we were still at Georgetown. These uh, studies were published in 2002, but all the work was done while we were still at Georgetown. And they show that fibromyalgia patients aren't making this up. We could see that when fibromyalgia patients said they hurt, even though we were only giving them a light pressure to their thumb, that we could actually see in their brain when we did functional MRI that they were hurting because we could see that brain regions like the primary somatosensory cortex and the secondary somatosensory cortex that we know are involved in perception of pain were being activated even though those fibromyalgia patients were only getting light pressure. Um, and so that study that we published in 2002 um, that's, that you see here, was one of the first studies that showed objective evidence that fibromyalgia patients weren't making this up. And this single study um, had a lot to do with the Food and Drug Administration 
um, allowing drugs to be approved specifically for fibromyalgia, because again, it would help legitimize that fibromyalgia is and was, was and is a real disease. Now, there's no debate about this, and we can do all sorts of different things with functional brain imaging. We can look at the degree to which different brain regions are either too connected to each other or not connected enough to each other. Um, and we've recently found that even in children that are pain-free that um, in, uh, in, uh, in a, a year later um, are going to develop new onset of uh, multifocal pain, that in these children, what we see is their brains are abnormal um, even before they start to develop pain. That, that we can almost see fibromyalgia um, about to happen um, in these 10-year-olds um, on functional brain imaging. Um, even the size and the shape of the brain changes in uh, these different chronic pain conditions. And we think it's just because the brain is remodeling in response to chronic pain. Um, in one big networks that we've been involved in for a long time called the MAP network, um, individuals with the condition interstitial cystitis were brought in and got all sorts of tests and procedures. And what we found is that a lot of the people with the label of interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, even though they carried that label, they on a body map, their pain was a lot more widespread. Only about 20% of the interstitial cystitis patients only had pain in their pelvis. A lot of them had pain in their entire abdomen. And most of them, in fact, looked a lot more like fibromyalgia patients and that their pain was much more widespread. And when we put people in the brain scanner and compared the people with, fibrom with interstitial cystitis that had just pain confined to their pelvis to those that look more like fibromyalgia, not surprisingly, um, the ones that looked more like fibromyalgia with widespread pain looked a lot more like fibromyalgia on brain imaging as well. And so we see that this nosoplastic pain, central sensitization, fibromyalgia-like pain can be imaged reliably. And um, again, these are still just research techniques. We can't, you can't order this on a patient in the United States now and get a functional MRI scan but these studies have been done over and over again for the last 10 to 20 years, and we can consistently see this pattern. Um, and the reason this is important is that the drug and the non-drug treatments that work for this kind of pain are quite different. The drugs that pre preferentially work in this kind of pain are not opioids or not non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Drugs like tricyclic drugs, um, you would know this drug as um, Elevil or amitriptyline, cyclobenzaprine is flexoril. Um, and if you're getting this lecture today and you're thinking that you or someone that you take care of might have this kind of pain, the drug Flexoril, which go, the generic name is cyclobenzaprine, a really low dose, five or 10 milligrams a couple hours uh, before bedtime can be really helpful. It's one of my favorite drugs for this kind of pain. Um, and it's a really old, uh, really inexpensive drug, cyclobenzaprine. The other drugs are drugs like that can be helpful are duloxetine. Um, th this used to be known as Cymbalta. Um, this is a drug that's working um, in the brain, as well as some drugs that were originally anti-seizure drugs, gabapentin and pregabalin, um, or Neurontin and Lyrica. Are, and these drugs only work in about one out of three people that have this kind of pain. So it's not in any way a sure thing that if someone has this kind of pain, one of these drugs is going to work, but they're way more likely to work than these drugs down here. And opioids in particular are a really bad idea for people with conditions like fibromyalgia because it's not just the case that they don't help this kind of pain. We think that in many cases, they actually will make this kind of pain worse and really opioids will actually turn up the amplifier louder. This is an um, article that I wrote in the leading pain journal talking about all the problems with chronic opioid therapy. But one of the big problems with opioids is that people when they initially start taking an opioid, when they have a condition like fibromyalgia for the first couple of weeks or the month or so, they will feel a little bit better. But the longer they take the opioid and the higher the dose they go up to, that the drugs actually stop helping pain. And unbeknownst to the person, they actually make the pain worse and worse and worse. And we see that at least half of the people that we can convince to come off of opioids actually have an improvement in their pain if they slowly, gradually taper their opioids. Um, and are able to come off of their opioid. Some people that are on opioids will have a worsening of their pain if they taper their opioids, and those people should probably stay on opioids. But if you, you or someone you know or love um, is on chronic opioid therapy and they haven't tried a slow, gradual taper, they should, because if they don't know they need to be on this drug, they shouldn't be on this class of drugs. Um, one of the things that 
a lot of doctors and most patients don't understand about opioids is the major problem with opioids in treating chronic pain is not addiction. Um, it's that these drugs often make people's pain worse and uh, worse yet, once people get on the drugs, they become dependent on the drugs. They're not addicted in most cases, but they're dependent and they can't get off of the drugs uh, even if they try to. This is a study we did with um, called PET imaging, where we gave um, a very potent opioid uh, carfentanil, uh, and we did PET imaging at the same time as we did functional MRI imaging. And it really looked as though in individuals with fibromyalgia, the body was over-releasing its own opioids. I think you all know that the body can release some of its own opioids called endorphins and enkephalins, and these are really structurally very similar to things like morphine or heroin um, or fentanyl. Um, and uh, that what we found in this study is that in these conditions like fibromyalgia, the body might be over-releasing its own internal opioids. That might be in part causing the fibromyalgia, and that, again, is a reason why you wouldn't want to give someone even more of an opioid because it would make this problem even worse. Um, cannabinoids or cannabis, I don't, I haven't kept up on whether um, Virginia or Maryland or DC, I know DC has legalized cannabis, um, but I don't know what is going on in Maryland or Virginia. Regardless, um, cannabis can be useful for um, treating pain. Uh, cannabidiol or CBD might be extremely useful because it's very safe and non-addictive. This is a joke. This is a cannabis plant talking to a poppy plant. The poppy is what opioids come from. And one of the good things about um, cannabis or cannabinoids is that they don't kill people, that you can't die of overdoses from cannabinoids. And we do a lot of work now with cannabinoids and um, cannabidiol or CBD, anyone with chronic pain should try CBD alone, starting at five to 10 milligrams twice a day, going up to 100 to 200 milligrams twice a day before they use any THC, because THC um, has a lot more side effects, it has more dangers. Um, and where the other thing we're learning about THC is a little bit of THC is a lot better for pain than a lot of THC, just like opioids. And the problem with a lot of the medical marijuana laws or the legalizing cannabis is people don't know that a little bit of THC is all they should be using for pain. And they end up using a lot of it and they just get stoned and they become couch potatoes rather than getting pain relief. <clears throat> the last part of my talk really quickly is why non-drug therapies are so important. Even if you start by having pain that's a problem in your knee or a problem in your brain, the longer you have it, you develop stress, you become less active, you start to sleep poorly, you gain weight, you develop bad habits. And so we have to use drug and non-drug therapies together because a lot of our non pharmacologic or non-drug therapies are addressing what happens as the longer you have pain, the worse your sleep is, the less active you are, the higher your stress levels are. And so we have to try to undo a lot of these downstream consequences of having chronic pain with a lot of these non-drug therapies. And <clears throat> these non-drug therapies can be incredibly effective. Just in the last couple of years, um, I wrote a um, article on fibromyalgia in 2014. And at that time, this was what the evidence base was for acupuncture, chiropractor manipulation, massage therapy, ultrasound. Um, but just in the last 10 years or so, all of these things here have moved up and up as we've done more and more therapies. Um, you can see now as I switch the slide that a bunch of these therapies now, there's modest evidence or strong evidence for all of these non drug treatments now. And the only thing that there's no evidence for is to do nothing. Literally, the, the biggest thing we can do as healthcare providers or as a friend or a family member or someone with chronic pain is get them to try some of these therapies that they maybe didn't ever think might help them. I never would have imagined um, 30 years or so ago when I was trained at Georgetown that I'd be recommending yoga and acupressure and Tai Chi and mindfulness meditation. But the evidence, the scientific evidence is there um, and these therapies can be really helpful and really effective. There's even five different kinds of cognitive behavioral therapy for pain. You can do the classic kind, you can do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or for sleep, which can be really helpful for people that do have sleep problems. There's so-called acceptance and commitment therapy. And then there's a special kind of cognitive behavioral therapy called emotional awareness therapy for um, people that have had a lot of trauma, 
um, people with a lot of PTSD or trauma, there's a special kind of uh, therapy that really might specifically help this kind of chronic pain. And websites can be helpful as well. This is a website um, that we used to have up that was specifically for individuals with fibromyalgia. And we did a trial of this website that was called FibroGuide. And this website alone worked better. It was more effective than any of the approved drugs in fibromyalgia. Um, we have a new version of the website and I would rec I'd strongly recommend that you go to this website. It doesn't, uh, we don't get any money for this. Everything is free. We used um, philanthropic funding, i.e. money that people gave us as donors to put up this website. Because we think that um, if more and more patients with chronic pain went to these websites and learned all the things they could do themselves to make their pain better, um, that they wouldn't have to go to doctors and hospitals and healthcare settings. There was a recent New York Times um, uh, editorial by Nicholas Kristof that I was quoted in about a week or two ago. Um, and I said that the first thing that people with chronic pain have to do is get um, a little bit more active um, and get sleeping better. And then they have to go to websites like this and they really have to try um, things like relaxation exercises or pacing or exercise or work on their sleep or acupressure. And you can get a lot of these therapies now just by going to websites like this that really give you direct as a patient or as someone trying to help work with someone, they give people direct access and they even let people track um, their symptoms as they're trying new therapies so they can see what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> and we're, try we're doing research in a lot of different um, areas. We might even be using diet and nutrition to treat pain. This is a study we published a couple of years ago. Um, people that happen to be um, getting a very low calorie diet because they were obese, we actually gave them some pain measures at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And we found that in this diet where people were eating a very low calorie diet in 12 to 16 weeks, they had dramatic improvements in pain and fibromyalgia scores and depression. And when we originally published this, we said, oh, look at, they lost all this weight and that that led to all this improvement and all these things. And it wasn't due to the weight loss. In subsequent studies, what we've shown is that when we put people on these diets, um, that uh, intermittent caloric restriction or diets that might just be 200 or 300 calories less than what you need uh, to sort of uh, what's called isocaloric. But, but again, mild diet um, restrictions might be able to lead to big improvements in pain and fatigue in a subset of individuals. And so I always end with this slide um, because these are all the treatments that are now available um, in the VA health centers across the country that take care of our veterans or the Department of Defense health centers. These are the um, health systems that are the most forward thinking with respect to reimbursing all of these therapies. A lot of insurance companies and a lot of health systems don't have all of these therapies, but this is the direction we're moving is that really all of these treatments work fairly well in a lot of different chronic pain conditions and our challenge is trying to get more and more people access um, to these non-pharmacologic, um, non-procedural therapy. And in some cases, um, have them circumvent the healthcare system. Uh, one of the other quotes um, that I was quoted in Nick Kristoff's um, article was um, that I think we've over-medicalized pain and a lot of individuals can self-manage um, their pain by again, becoming more active, getting better sleep, um, even hydration can be extremely important in a subset of individuals with chronic pain. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Claw, for that um, great information. So um, we are going to take uh, questions from the audience now. You can submit them in the Q&A option on your Zoom panel. And um, we do have a few questions that came in um, one of them is, is there any indication that insurance companies will begin approving uh, MRI imaging as part of or diagnosing, um, says RO, would this ultimately be more cost effective and time effective? The problem right now isn't the, for this, the problem isn't the insurance companies. The problem, the insurance companies are a problem for reimbursing for things like acupuncture and meditation and things like that. But they're, um, 
the problem is more a technological problem. We don't, um, the things that we do on a research basis are not yet really ready for prime time or ready for use in clinical care, or clinical practice. Because when we do brain imaging, what we have to do is we look at a group of people with fibromyalgia and compare to a group of people that are healthy controls. We can't look at a single functional MRI in a single fibromyalgia patient and say, ah, this person has fibromyalgia. So the, the problem with the imaging is that the technology isn't really there yet. It's that, that is not the fault of the insurance companies. Um, but, I, you, but you should be um, prodding your insurance companies and your third party payers to reimburse for a lot of those things I had on that last slide, because the, again, the evidence base is there and they just have to sort of come along and realize that, that, that these things, just like, and again, the veterans hospitals, the Department of Defense hospitals, they came to the realization that if they reimbursed for those things, it would save them a lot of money because people wouldn't get all this really expensive surgery and injections and medications and things like that if they made more of these treatments available to their patients. Thank you. Um, another, uh, the few questions um, from one attendee says, a 9 year old female has chronic pain at the right sciatic nerve and to relieve pain, has a physician's office admit her, uh, administer steroid injections. The injections cause further pain and doesn't fix the issue. Um, so the question is, what are the risks of steroid injections? What would you recommend as an alternative treatment? Massage, magnesium, magnesium supplements twice a day, blue EMU cream applied at the site. So, well, first of all, I mean, I don't, I have to be careful about giving specific medical advice. So I'll just talk in general terms. Mm -hmm. um, any treatment, regardless of whether it's a steroid injection or a chiropractic manipulation or anything else, if you're getting that treatment and it's not making you better, stop getting that treatment. You have a, you have a lot of power as a patient, and I don't, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, but um, you as the patient control what treatments you get. If you have pain and you go to a surgeon, they're, eventually they're going to do surgery because that's what they're trained to do. If you have pain and you go to a naturopath or someone that's treating like take integrative medicine physician that's trained in using things like acupuncture and stuff like that, they'll give you those treatments. If you go to someone that's trained, an anesthesiologist that's trained in doing like injections into the back, they'll find somewhere to inject and they'll inject that. So you have a lot of control and power as a patient as to what treatments you get. Don't think of yourself as this like passive thing that just goes, you know, wherever you, um, I'll, I'll say again, healthcare providers will do what they're trained to do. And so stop going to people that do procedures if you have pain, because you, that, that they don't work for most kinds of pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, I, I, let me, I can actually read, I, I have the things up, so I'll read these quickly now. So, sure, sure. Um, uh, opioids, corticosteroids makes pain worse. This kind of pain that I'm talking about, um, makes no opioids can be used to treat acute pain, but they don't work to treat this kind of chronic pain and they don't work very well to treat any kind of chronic pain. Corticosteroids are quite different. Corticosteroids are anti powerful anti-inflammatory drugs that are often injected into a spot, but opioids and corticosteroids are quite different. Um, radiofrequency ablation, that's where they burn the nerve. And again, these treatments might work in 20% of people with low back pain. Um, if you um, have one of these procedures and it doesn't work, don't ha go get another procedure don't, and another procedure and another procedure. Go to a different physician that has a different approach um, rather than thinking that the problem is they just didn't burn the right nerve. Um, to confirm, people become dependent and cannot get off drugs. Opioids do not work. Do they make pain? They make pain worse. There's a question mark there. I don't think. I I think that's a true statement. Uh, not not everyone in the in the pain field is as anti opioid as I am, um, but I'm there for good reason. I think that it's a very very small subset of people in whom the the benefit from opioids exceeds the risk. 
People don't understand, most, most patients that are taking an opioid were never told when they start taking a, an opioid regularly. They're, 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 again, now I'm not talking about someone that's addicted. I'm talking someone that has chronic pain and they're oh, once a month going and getting their whatever, their Percocet, their, what, their oxycodone, their oxycontin refilled. Taking that opioid makes you 70% more likely in the next year to die. That's like a huge increase in what's called all-cause mortality because people that are taking opioids don't just die from, from drug overdoses. They have higher rates of heart attacks. They have higher rates of track effect accidents. They have higher rates of suicides. They die of all sorts of different things at much higher rates. These are just really dangerous drugs. And people shouldn't be taking them unless you know they're really helping you. So it's really that, that if someone's on an opioid, if they tried to slowly gradually taper and their pain got a lot worse, then that, I said that already, then maybe you need to stay on an opioid. Maybe you're one of the people for whom that risk of all these bad things happening to you is that there's a benefit. You're deriving a benefit. But if you don't know that you're not one of the half of the people that's on an opioid that's going to feel better when you stop the opioid, then do that because it's just you're it's you're putting yourself out for huge risks where with perhaps no benefit or even a negative benefit. Um, in in that again, we do see a sizable number of people whose pain actually gets better when they slowly come off an opioids. Foods or food groups that are helpful. Um, Certain people, there's two diets that people can try, elimination diets. There's certain people with this kind of like fibromyalgia kind of problem that are sensitive to gluten. Um, and so the gluten-free diets can be helpful, but the people that have this kind of gluten sensitivity don't have to entirely eliminate gluten. They just can reduce it because they're just more sensitive to it. It's They can almost think of it as like a bright light is like, put your sunglasses on and don't you don't have to not go outside, but but you you know you you don't have to entirely eliminate it. You're just going to have to reduce it. The other diet that um, has been shown to be um, effective in a subset of fibromyalgia patients is a low glutamate diet. And if you just Google low glutamate, the main things that people are avoiding with glutamate uh, low glutamate diets are there's a lot of foods that have MSG monosodium glutamate in them. And um, a lot of artificial sweeteners uh, are as well. So that's that diet's actually a lot easier to follow than a than a low gluten diet. So if you want to try um, a dry diet, and just try these diets for seven to ten days. If you feel better, keep stay on the diet. If you don't, then just like all these other treatments, then move on to the next one. Um, what when brain image shows white matter? What does that mean long term? Oh, these are white and gray matter. You're supposed to have white and gray matter. The the white matter is more the the nerve sheaths, and the gray matter is like the the what's called the cortex. So there's nothing wrong with your brain. If there would be something wrong with your brain if you only had white matter or gray matter. You're you, you're supposed to have a mix of both. Um, there was a question. Patches. Yep, you got it. Mm -hmm. Uh. Yeah, so- Dr. Claude, could you read it out loud because the audience can't see the questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. Have Butrans Patch has been successful in helping with spine pain and aiding? Yeah, I, I actually think they can be. They haven't been officially shown, but the, the opioid that's in Butrans um, is buprenorphine, which is the same opioid that's in Suboxone, which is an, uh, a drug that we use for opioid addiction or for substance use disorder. And so I do think that the Butrans patches can be really helpful. Um, and that if someone with a condition like fibromyalgia needs to be taking an opioid, that the, the opioid that's in Butrans, buprenorphine, would be a better opioid than most other um, opioids. Hmm. How effective are CBDs and TX chronic pain? What dose? Uh, so the CBD is cannabidiol. It is the one of the components in uh, cannabis now that's legal everywhere in the U.S. Because um, there's two there's two ways that you can get CBD. You can extract CBD from hemp, the plant hemp, and you can extract CBD from the plant cannabis. 
Um, hemp used to be cannabis a long time ago, and they specifically bred the THC out of cannabis to make hemp. So because the, uh, three or four years ago, the United States government signed the hemp law into a federal law that you can get CBD from hemp legally in all 50 states. And the dose to start at is five to 10 milligrams twice a day, but some people need as high as 100 to 200 milligrams twice a day of CBD. And that's non uh, habit forming, non addictive, non, that is something that I would highly recommend that people try if, if they have pain and they haven't tried it. When they add any THC, then all of a sudden you're in the um, area of that is legal in 50 states or in 25 states and illegal in 25 states. And that still is a schedule one drug. Um, and that was what I was alluding to that a really low amount of THC can be helpful. Mm, okay. Um, and I see a participant has raised their hand. Can you please use the Q&A box? Um, we're not having anyone come off the mic. Um, we had a question too that came in. What are some risk factors that influence the development of pain in the central nervous system, specifically the brain? Uh, female. Having uh, a family history of that kind of pain. So a family history of people that have conditions like headache or fibromyalgia or irritable bowel. Uh, there are different types of being exposed to different types of stress can make this more likely to occur. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we know that this, you know, like after the Gulf War, we did a lot of research showing that, you know, what was called Gulf War syndrome and then Gulf War illnesses, it was probably the same kind of thing triggered by people being deployed to Gulf. We actually even think that long COVID might be this the same thing as this, is that in a lot of people that the infection, the COVID triggers this, but after the COVID is long gone, this is left, because we see this with post Lyme disease is, is the same thing as um, mm -hmm. this syndrome. Of, so anyway, there's a lot of things that seem to be capable of, of triggering this. Some of them are more sort of genetic, you can't do anything about, and others are more um, environmental. But mm -hmm. if you think you might have this, and especially if you think you might have, if you have this and you have kids that might be developing this, get them involved in things like yoga and Tai Chi and meditation and get them involved in exercise. Some of these things that are part of wellness programs, you don't have to tell uh, you know, a teenager that, they, that they're on their way to developing fibromyalgia, tell them they'll feel a lot better throughout their entire life if they use some of these, you know, things like yoga and meditation and things like that, just to help stay well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, can you have rebound pain from using the NSAIDs? From uh, headache is the main issue with rebound pain is that, uh, that people can get rebound headache if they take non-steroidals, but for other pain conditions, they don't usually get rebound pain. Okay. Um, for someone who's under drug testing, will taking CBD affect the drug test? Oh, by law, CBD, um, if it's labeled as CBD, it has to have less than 0.3% THC. If you're taking like 10, 20 milligrams of CBD a couple times a day, there's no danger that that 0.3% could accumulate in your system. But if you're taking a couple hundred milligrams of CBD a day, that 0.3% could be enough to turn a urine drug screen positive. So you would need to be a little bit careful at the higher levels of CBD, because again, it the CBD, even that's allowed from the hemp bill that you could buy at Walgreens anywhere in the country can have a tiny little bit of THC in it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Claw. Um, we are at the end of our program hour. Um, and this program has been so informative. We have many folks who have thanked you already. And we hope that um, through the session, um, our, our audience has a better understanding of chronic pain that stems from the brain. And you'll be able to use that knowledge in your caregiving journey. So thank you again, Dr. Claw, for this excellent presentation and for sharing your knowledge with us and your willingness to answer the audience questions. And to our audience, thank you so much for making space to be with us here today. Again, as you sign out, there will be a brief survey. 
So please take a moment to answer those questions and let us know your thoughts of today's presentation. And if you would like to share comments with our presenter today, uh, you can include that in the survey. I also want to invite you to attend our next caregiver webinar on brain fitness, keys to extending independence on June 15th from noon to 1 p.m. Dr. Ellen Clark, who has a PhD in human factors and applied cognition, will explain how to extend independence through improved brain health. Um, she'll also provide an overview of six different evidence-based brain health improvement techniques and how to successfully implement them to maintain and, maintain and extend independence. Uh, we hope you can enjoy, um, <laughs> that you can join us then. And I wish everyone a great afternoon. Thank you.